Yeah. That's the old ship sitting out there. The SS Sumatra. A good ship, but I never want to sail with her again. I was her captain for many years. Mostly the South Pacific, Surabaya, the Philippines, Java, Ceylon, and up and down the west coast of India. Ah, we had adventures, this old steel lady and me. But the last one was the worst one. It was a long time ago, but I'll never forget it. I still wake up at night screaming, and I don't scare easily. The newspapers carried the story of Khan. King Kong was what Denim called the beast. Who was Denim? I'll tell you the story about Denim, Driscoll, Anne, and the monster, King Kong. I first met Denim, I think it was in 1932. Yeah, we were laid up here in New York Harbor. No cargo, no credit. A full crew to pay, and I had no money. It was winter, a heavy snow, Christmas coming. And if the devil came up that gangplank and asked me to sail him to hell, if he had the money, I would have given him the best cabin and sailed on the first tide. This was my cabin. I remember sitting here very worried when Driscoll, my first mate, knocked on the door. Come. The man came aboard, Captain, says he must see you. Mr. Driscoll, if he's a bill collector, tell him I've jumped ship. He drove up to the dock in a chauffeur-driven car. So? Well, uh, don't stand there. Tell him I'll be delighted to see him. That's what he said. Come in, sir. Captain Engelhorn, Mr. Denham. Sit down, sir. Thank you. And uh, what can I do for you? Captain, I want to charter your boat. I'm Denham of Denham Motion Pictures Incorporated. My company makes travel films. I want you to take me, my cameraman, an actor or two, to the Southwest Pacific. I've been told you're familiar with the area. More than familiar. The Pacific is where I got my sea legs and learned my trade. Where exactly is your destination? That's something I can't tell you until we get there. Well, a ship must have a destination. A point on the chart to sail to, Mr. Denham. I have the exact longitude and latitude. I'll give them to you after we reach the East Indies. Now, for the services of your ship, crew, yourself, I'm prepared to pay a more than generous sum. A more than generous sum. Well, times were bad. And a sailor might just as well be a farmer if he's not at sea. I agree to Mr. Denham's deal. But if I could have seen ahead, I would have thrown Mr. Denham overboard. Secure that number three hat! I up! Go away! Easy now! Mr. Driscoll. Sir? I want to hoist anchors and sail on the ebb tide. Anxious to get underway? I get sick living on shore too long. Well, engine room reports steam is up the full. Well, I'll be glad to get away from this cold. Oh, heading south then, hmm? South and east. And that's all I know. Well, Mr. Denham is punctual. Send two men down to help him with his gear, Mr. Driscoll. Aye, right, sir. There's a woman with him. I recognize the outlines, Mr. Driscoll. Two men to the dock. And uh, make ready to cast off, Mr. Driscoll. Aye, sir. Denim and his movie people came aboard and were shown to the cabins below decks. Anne Darrow, a beautiful young lady, was an out-of-work actress who asked no questions. She had a job, and the idea of spending time in the tropics appealed to her. Stand by to cast off all lines. Single up, Mr. Driscoll. Single up, four and up. Cast off, Mr. Driscoll. Let's go, four and up. Helmsman, all astern, slow. 
Let the tide take her. Aye, aye, sir. Out of port. Out of port, yes, sir. Now, midships. Midships, she is, sir. All ahead, slow. All ahead, slow, sir. Take over the helm, Mr. Driscoll. I'll give you the new course when we clear the Ambrose Light. Aye, sir. I relieve you now, sir. I'll be below to check with our passengers. Aye, I tried very hard to be friendly with Mr. Denham, but that was very difficult. So we arrived at a working agreement. He was in charge of his crew. I was in charge of the ship. But nothing I could say would get Denham to give me the slightest hint of our destination. I even had Driscoll speak with the girl. He was, at that time, a handsome young man, and I knew he upheld the traditions of the sea by having a girl in every port. <laughs> no, no, I'm not much of an actress, just a beginner, and this is quite a chance for me. What are you supposed to do? Has Denham shown you a script? No, he said we'd play the scenes as they happen. It's a travelogue, so I suppose I'll be sitting around watching natives dance or fish or hunt or something <laughs> like that. Well, that doesn't seem like too much. I I'm the only actor in the company, so it'll be plenty for me. I see. Well, Mr. Driscoll, what do you think of our star? As pretty as I've ever seen, Mr. Denham. <laughs> I thought sailors only talked that way in books. Oh, there's a bit of truth in everything, Mr. Arrow. I might be able to use that line, Mr. Driscoll. <laughs> And I want to run some film tests. The camera's set up front. Uh, for it, Mr. Denham. Yeah, for it. Uh, up ahead in the nose of the boat. The prow is what it's called. Oh, you know what I mean. And put on some makeup, eyeshadow, lipstick. We'll take a look. He's not much of a sailor. He'll learn. Or Captain Engelhorn will toss him to the sharks. Well, you better go along. Up to the nose of the boat. <laughs> Denham had set up cameras up forward on the foredeck. He had the girl leaning on a bollard. The weather was getting warmer as we headed south. A good ship, a calm sea, and people going about their work. Okay, Anne. Yes. Look around. Roll the cameras. Action. Anne, look to your right. I'll look left. Now, look at me. That's right. Now, you see something. Oh. You don't know what it is. Slowly now. You're amazed by it. Hold that. Now, you become frightened. It's nothing you've ever seen before. It's coming closer. 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 You're too frightened to run. You're helpless. You can't scream. You're trying to hide it from your eyes. Good. Now scream. Scream. Scream for your life. <laughs> it was only a simple scream test, just to see how well Anne can follow direction. <laughs> but, Mr. Denham, it would seem to me you had some purpose. The poor kid was terrified. She's in her cabin now. Won't let anyone come near her. Oh, that just means she's a good actress. There's something you're not telling us, Denham. That's perfectly correct, mister. And I don't intend to tell you until I'm ready. You tell us now, Denny. Now, look, mister. I chartered this ship. You go where I tell you to go, and when I tell my actress to scream, she screams. And it's none of your business, sailor. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Driscoll! Mr. Driscoll! Stop that! Mr. Driscoll! You will go on deck and cool your temper. Mr. Denham, you will go below to your cabin. Oh, don't give me any orders. I don't go downstairs for anybody. The expression is below, Mr. Denham. I am master of life and death aboard this vessel. And you will go below, or I will have you locked in the brig. A brig means a prison, Mr. Denham. Mr. Driscoll? Aye, sir. You better behave as a first mate should. If you expect to command your own ship, you cannot make clear decisions when your mind is muddled with personal feelings. 
The safety of the ship and her crew is your first concern. You can break Denham's neck when we're safe in port. Is that clear? Aye, aye, sir. Very clear. Somewhere off Hatteras, we ran into bad weather. The waves were running high and the sea broke over the bridge. As sometimes happens in a storm, we shook loose some of the cargo. I sent Driscoll below to make everything secure. He was a good sailor, so I left it all in his hands. But below decks in number two hold... This is the captain. Will you come below, sir? Problems, Mr. Driscoll? Yes, sir. You better come and take a look. In the older type ships, you had to cross the deck to get to the cargo hatches. Safety lines were rigged and I held down for dear life. As I crossed the deck to number two hold, I was annoyed with Bristol, but I knew he would never call me unless he had a good reason. These crates tore loose, Captain. This one broke open. Ah, ten himmel. Denim has enough here to start a war. Dynamite, hand grenades, there's a case of high-powered rifles, ammunition, gas grenades. Why would he need these to make movies? Yes, sir, that's what I was wondering. Just nail up the crates and say nothing. I sir. Denim said all he was carrying was motion picture equipment and supplies for six months. As far as I'm concerned, that's all he is carrying. I sir. We know of nothing else. None of these guns and dynamite will be unloaded from the ship. Keep the hatch closed and locked, Mr. Driscoll. And give me the keys. We made good time on our way through the Panama Canal into the Pacific. Through every type of weather. Now the skies were clear and blue as the days grew from warm to hot. On a course of south by west, past Pitcairn Island, Rapa, then along the Tropic of Capricorn, almost to the Fijis, then at 20 degrees south latitude and 160 degrees longitude west from Greenwich, with New Caledonia dead ahead. Come. Ah, Mr. Denham. Captain, I believe we've been making excellent time. So it depends on where we're heading. You know Lord Howe Island? Dead south of us, uh, Mr. Denham. Then change course southeast of Howe Island to 40 degrees south and 140 degrees, 20 minutes east latitude. That's our destination. My charts show no islands there? That's the fault of the charts, Captain. I assure you that there is an island there, and that is our destination. And for what reason, Mr. Denham? The weirdest, wildest, most impossible thing you've ever seen. I'm going to make a movie the likes of which has never been made before. Have you ever heard of the word Kong? There are many things I haven't heard. And I, Captain. I first heard about Kong some five years ago. The man who told me was mad, raving. I would have dismissed the whole story if I hadn't seen a few feet of film he brought back. What I saw was enough to start me on my way. And frankly, Captain, now that we're almost there, I'm a little scared. You aren't the first man to be scared by a rumor. Now, you forget the film. I include the film. You know, lights and shadows make strange images. That is all your Kong is, believe me. Part of me would like to believe you, but the other half knows better. Then what is Kong, if not imagination? Not imagination, Captain. Kong is some strange kind of giant beast. Helmsman, all ahead slow. Rolling up fast, Captain, so run aground. Helmsman, all stop. Let go the anchors, Mr. Driscoll. Let's go, boat! Captain Englehorn. Do you hear the drums? Nothing unusual about drums in this part of the world. Call away number one boat, Mr. Driscoll. Stand by, number 
We headed for shore, and the closer we came to the island, the more I was sorry we left our guns aboard the Sumatra. The beach was lined with native warriors, armed with spears and shields. I would not call it a hospitable welcome. Behind the beach, the forest began, and rising above the trees, a most incredible sight. A wall perhaps 40 feet high, made all of stone and running the length of the island as far as I could see I looked at Denham and remembered the story he had told of Kong. For the first time, I began to believe that he was telling the truth. Anything seemed possible now. Mr. Driscoll, look. That native girl. Captain, there in the center, there's a girl tied hand and foot. Stand to, Mr. Driscoll. Don't try to be a hero. These people have their own customs. Listen now, all of you. If you're frightened, don't show it. This is good acting practice for all of us, Mr. Denham. You go. This land taboo. Pray do not belong. Many death here. Chief, we come from far away. Ship sails very long time. We here have come. Come. Not for you, Kung mighty killer. We give girl. She goes stay alone with Kong. One year of time. The girl's a sacrifice. Your woman with gold hair. You give to great Kong. I give you many things. Driscoll, get Anne out of here, back to the boat. Move. Great chief, woman with golden hair, not for Kong. She belonged to us. Get him. Stop back slowly. No panic. Mighty chief, very powerful. Me, chief, I'm more powerful. Girl with golden hair belong me. Get him. Move back. He's thinking it over. When he makes up his mind, we'd better be off this island. Aye! It was a close call. We had raised the boat beyond the breakers when the natives reached the beach. Safe on board the ship, I tried to get Denham to leave the island, but his desire for making movies got the better of his judgment. I agreed to stay when he promised he'd leave Anne aboard ship. The drums sounded throughout the night. We could see the flickering campfires on the beach. I thought of that poor native girl tied up as a sacrifice for Kong. We slept fitfully that night. Then, sometime during the middle watch, Driscoll informed me that Anne was missing. We searched the ship, but she had gone. Anne had been taken by a war party of natives who had climbed aboard and captured her. Anne was to be a sacrifice to Kong. From the sounds coming from the island, there was little time for action. Mr. Driscoll! Aye, sir. Get five men, open up number two hold. Mr. Denham... I will overlook your bringing arms aboard this ship without permission. You will come along with a party. On the double, Mr. Driscoll. See that rifles, ammunition, hand grenades, gas grenades are issued to all the men. Now, you go to call. Say him. Village in no. peace. No. We'll no. make song. No. Tell children story of woman with gold hair. No. Aye! You wait. An old lion will come and take you. Ha, 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 ha.
I've never seen anything that huge, Mr. Denham. We should have brought cannon. Rifles will be of little use against a monster that size. We must get Anne. We can't leave her. No one is leaving the girl. But can we fight that beast? You can stay here and discuss what you're going to do. I'm going after Kong. Kong, like a heavy tank, broke through the rainforest. Trees had fallen before him. And he left footprints twelve feet long. From time to time we could see Kong's great head over the treetops. This was a nightmare world we had come to. We were now in what seemed to be a slice of prehistoric times which somehow found a way to survive until now. All around us were gigantic ferns, strange trees and animals, great lizards that should have been long since dead. Had it not been for the thought of the girl, I would have turned back many times. I am brave enough in the world, I know, but here... The trail of Khan led us through what looked like a prehistoric wing of a museum come to life. Denim, in spite of the dangers, took time to identify the beasts as we saw them. Stagosaurus, Triceratops, Megatherium, Magacerops, Hyanodon... Flying things, crawling things. It would have interested me more if they didn't look at us like we were a good meal on the move. He's up ahead, Captain. What about Anne? Alive so far. How far ahead? Kong is across a deep ravine, about a thousand feet drop to the bottom. Maybe a hundred feet across. There might be a way to go around it. If the girl is alive, we cannot take the chance of going around. I had the men cut down a large tree and drop it across the chasm to use it as a bridge. On the other side, I could see Kong. I was certain we were near his lair. First, I sent four of my men across. The beast saw them. He gently placed the hand down on the ground, and then he started for the log. <laughs> Those four men held on for dear life as that giant monster shook and rolled the log. Finally, Kong lifted the hundred-foot tree and slammed it back on the ground. The log was cracked but in place across the chasm. The four men were dead. And Kong guarded the far edge of the chasm. We had no choice but to go back. And was lost. Look. Over there. What, what kind of beast is that? It's going for Anne. Try to scare it off. Kong. Kong sees it. What is that thing? Can't tell exactly. It's something like Tyrannosaur. Heliosinkus. A man-eater. This is a batch of prehistoric monsters come to life while we modern men armed with modern weapons too powerless to do anything. While the two giants fought, Driscoll picked up Anne, who had fainted from shock, and raced across the cracked tree which lay across the chasm. Kong had defeated a 30-foot lizard that stood 18 feet tall. Kong would catch us. There was no escape, no place of safety, except maybe one. That was down the side of the chasm to the rushing river. We started down. Kong stood above us, glaring down at us. The huge I couldn't understand why he let us live. And then I realized that monstrosity, that relic from a million years ago, had a heart. It didn't want to hurt the girl. 
Kong seemed almost human then. I almost knew what he would do next. He would meet us downstream. Some place where he could get Anne without harming her. And kill the rest of us. We carried deep to the middle of the river while Kong followed us along the banks, roaring and beating his chest. And then we saw the rock cavern that led the river underneath a huge wall out to safety. Kong left us little choice. We cried, smiling at each other, then took deep breaths and let the current carry us through to the other side of the wall and safety. Anne. Anne, are you all right? Oh, that thing, that horrible thing. I thought I was losing my mind. No. I'll never be able to forget it. Never. Never as long as I live. Anne, don't think about it. That's the end of Kong. Captain, we'd make a fortune if we could bring Kong alive to the States. I'd rather be a live sea captain, Mr. Denham. Just think about it. Denham Enterprises presents King Kong. Bravo. I don't think that big ape would sign a contract, Denham. Go ahead. Ask him. Run for the shore. It's it, it, Go on. Run. I'm going to try and get him. He'll rip you to bits, Denham. Come on. Let go. A couple of gas grenades ought to stop him dead. One over, one under, one in front. It's still coming. Three of those would have put a regiment to sleep. It's impossible. Complain to the company who made them. Get to the boat. Come on, Denham. The gas grenades, they're working. Mr. Denham, I think you're a very brave but foolish man. He's all yours. Yeah, he's all... Oh, oh. And Denham is all mine. I'll take him to the boat. Poor Kong. He looks so harmless now. It took most of a day to get Kong out to the ship and placed in the hold. I had anchor chain welded over the hatch. We had a pretty good prison for the giant ape. Kong was beaten and he knew it. He did nothing except uh, now and then trying to knock out the size of the ship. Only Anne could calm him down. She would stand by the hatchway and speak to the beast. Poor thing. Poor Kong. No one will hurt you. Anne is here. Couldn't hurt him if we tried. It's a little sad to see anything in captivity. Oh, he's done enough damage in his day, Anne. He was only protecting himself. And we were only trying to protect you. Were you? Let's get away from your friend because... There is an old sailor's wish, calm sea and prosperous voyage, which we had going back. Mr. Driscoll and Anne asked me to be best man, but I was captain and couldn't marry them if I accepted that honor. Mr. Denham was best man. Anne and Driscoll became man and wife. When we sailed into New York Harbor, we were a happy ship carrying the strangest cargo ever to come into that port. Denham had a theater rented in the middle of New York City, in Times Square. There were plenty who'd pay to see this prehistoric killer, and just as many who thought Kong was a fake, but would pay just to ooh and ah. Kong was no longer the beast from that prehistoric jungle. He was frightened and beaten, and he went wherever Denham took him. Kong seemed like some monstrous organ grinder's monkey. It was the first night that Kong was to be shown. The theater was plastered with signs. King Kong, the name Denham had given the great ape. Denham asked me to be in the audience, to introduce me as the captain who shared all the dangers. Driscoll and Anne 
were also there. Denham said love interest was very important. In spite of himself, he was a brave man, and that we had to respect. The curtain went up. Ladies and gentlemen, a beast out of history, out of place, out of time, a sight once seen by cavemen, but never before viewed by modern man. Ladies and gentlemen, King Kong! Kong, frightened by the sounds of a strange world, began pulling at his huge chains. He looked out into the audience, and he saw her Anne. We rushed her out of the theater. As the crowds panicked, Kong trampled them as he went after Anne. Kong, loose in the city, police and fire departments, useless as Kong began his search for the girl. The city came to a stop. No place was safe. There was no place to hide as Kong raged up and down the streets, crushing everything in his way. Driscoll and I hurried Anne back to the ship with the idea of getting underway and out to sea, but we never would have made it. Kong, with that logic peculiar to the great apes, made his way to the river and to the ship. He saw us. He saw Anne. And then the great monster reached out. He took Anne. Army Air Force, Roosevelt Field, officer of the base team. Yes, sir, there's a fighter squadron. <laughs> well, I suggest you call the zoo. We don't handle monkeys here. What? You're kidding. Right away. All pilots, man your planes. Condition red. Repeat. Condition red. This is not an exercise. Repeat. This is not an exercise. Kong destroyed all in his way. All we could do was to follow. It was impossible to shoot at him for fear of hitting Anne. Kong, in a panic, looking for safety found the only place he thought he would be safe. Slowly, carrying Anne gently in one paw, he began to climb the Empire State Building, a hundred and two stories into the air, over a thousand feet from the ground. The crowds below were silent with fear. The only sound was Anne. Suddenly, from a long way away... sound of hope for the city, and maybe the end for Anne. The fighter planes were coming in, five planes, each with two machine guns and a few bombs. Driscoll heard them and started into the building, pushing through the line of police. Dawn was just breaking, and there they were, nine fighter planes flying straight towards Kong. He held the girl high up in the air. The planes zoomed away. see Kong put the girl down and hope that Driscoll had pulled her to safety. The fighters, with one plane missing now, continued making their runs on Kong. And he stood there, pawing at them, trying to swipe them out of the air, modern bees against a giant. 
How much could Kong take? How many bullets? I don't know how long it took. All I could see was Kong weaving back and forth, always trying to fight off the planes. A monster fighting for its life. And then Kong began to topple, to stagger. The police pushed the crowds back, back. And the planes made one more run. And that is all, the story of Kong, King Kong, a yesterday that lived today. A story to frighten children, unbelievable, impossible, incredible, whatever you choose to call it, but I know it to be the truth.